It's late August of 1994, just a few days before the start of my senior year of high school. At a preseason football practice, my coach breaks our team into two lines for our first tackling drill of the season. When the first two players smash into each other, my knees buckle, my stomach turns, my head spins. I know I'll be okay against one of those little guys, but God, what if I get matched up against one of those monsters? My nerves start getting the best of me. Instead of focusing and trying to learn anything from this drill, I am completely distracted. The only thing I seem to care at all about is who my opponent's going to be. So when I realize that I'm going face to face with Joey Perdoni. <laughs> Joey is an absolute beast. He's the biggest guy on our team. He's already got a scholarship to play defensive end in Georgia next year. This is going to be bad. <laughs> I immediately start feeling so sorry for myself. The only thing I want to do right now is be able to move my position in this line, but I'm afraid someone might notice if I try. I'd been attacked, not by Joey. I was attacked by my own mind. I was completely unable to compete because my mind had been hijacked. And I had no tools, no tactics, no weapons to combat my vulnerable and scattered mind. Since that day, I've become obsessed with how our minds influence our performance. And today, I coach professional CrossFit athletes who compete for millions of dollars in the title of fittest man and fittest woman on earth. In my work, there is one unavoidable truth. We compete. And that truth doesn't end when we walk off the competition floor. It has always been a part of all of our lives. We compete for better jobs. We compete to better schools. Heck, we compete to get a date with the hottie at the coffee shop. So if we want to start to win in this cutthroat environment, we need to start getting some competitive advantages on our side. In order for us to unlock our ultimate competitive advantage, we must weaponize our minds. Now, I get it. When we, hear, when we hear about the power of the mind, especially coming from a coach, we instinctively think about mental toughness. What I'm talking about is not mental toughness. You don't have to be tough. It's not about pain tolerance, and it certainly isn't about sports, athletics. It's not even about willpower. While mental toughness is on defense, the idea is fortitude, grit, stay in the game, finish the race. A weaponized mind is on offense. It's about advantages and winning. It's not a shield, it's a spear. Now the problem is we've been using the wrong strategies and tactics to try to teach and unlock this weapon. It doesn't come from harder training sessions or being the kid that runs extra sprints after practice. That's physical dominance. And it definitely doesn't come from getting yelled at by a drill instructor or a coach. That's, that's just verbal abuse. While it might seem like mastering your mind could take a lifetime, getting started boils down to just two fundamental tactics. That's it. If you understand these two foundational principles, you are on your way to becoming unstoppable. The first tactic is to set your sights. Halfway through a qualifying event for the 2014 CrossFit Games, Katrin David's daughter, a young athlete from Iceland, is struggling to climb a rope. The stakes could not be higher for Katrin. If she finishes this rope climb, finishes this workout, she'll qualify for the world championships. And if she misses, she's out. All eyes are on her. She needs just one more pull to get to the top of this rope. Even with all of her strength and all of her might, it's just not there. She loses her grip, crashes to the floor, bursts into tears, and fails to qualify for the games. While it seems like it was her grip that failed her, 
Katrin senses that her mind may have been the real culprit and moves to Boston to train with me. In two short years, Katrin went from being an emotional and immature little girl who cried on the competition floor in front of thousands of fans to winning the world championships the next two years in a row. She's now recognized as one of the fiercest competitors in any sports. The difference between the fragile Katrin and the fierce Katrin was not harder training sessions or improved skill sets. It was understanding how and what to focus on. When Katrin first moved from Iceland to work with me in our first face-to-face -face conversation, we didn't talk about rope climbs or competing. We talked about the importance of focus. Together, we made a list on a whiteboard of all the things that may tempt her focus in the coming year. Things like sponsors, social media, what other athletes might be doing for training, how to deal with bad weather, bad judges, and dozens and dozens more. It's an overwhelming list for sure, and it's a trap. Camouflaged inside this massive list is a much smaller one. I draw a circle around the center five. Training, recovery, nutrition, sleep, and mindset. This is where we will set our sights. Only those five things can catch her in control. Can she influence and can she change? So this is where we'll give all of our attention, energy, effort, and power to. Anything outside of her sights is also outside of her control, and try as we may, we can't change or influence those things. We must learn to view those things as distractions that need to be ignored. Now, success like Katrin's certainly does not come from any one specific thing. But I do believe it starts with understanding this fundamental principle. Recognize what it is you can control and what you can't. Now, that, that sounds so ridiculously simple. Because it is. Yet we all struggle with this every day. The cool part is we have endless opportunities to work on setting our sights. So next time a coworker happens to get promoted ahead of you, don't get all hot and bothered, stressed out about something that you can't control. Instead, double down on what you can. Commit to being the hardest worker in that room. Be the first to the office and the last to leave every day. If your three-year-old spills their juice on you at the breakfast table before some big presentation, don't get upset about something that you can't control that's now in the past. Instead, calmly console your toddler, go upstairs, and change your pants. <laughs> we are all frantically climbing the ladders of our careers, health, and marriages. If we don't first learn to set our sights on what we can control, those ladders turn into escalators going in the wrong direction. Yes, we are working hard, and yes, we are busier than ever. But are we really going anywhere? Let's learn to set our sights and begin to weaponize our minds. The second tactic is to kill the critic. A cannon shell rips through the windshield of my grandfather's World War II plane, instantly killing three of his crew. With his plane on fire, he ejects from 22,000 feet and is taken prisoner by German soldiers when he lands. After two years of imprisonment and torture, my grandfather and his fellow POWs are ordered to death march to a second prisoner camp. Day and night, they march through the worst blizzard Germany has seen in 25 years. Those that are too slow, too frail, too weak, fall or are left to die on the side of the street. The remaining prisoners are loaded in the boxcars of a train. They're so tightly packed that they're forced to stand for days, covered in urine, 
feces and vomit. When they arrive at the second prisoner camp, my grandfather is starved. Standing almost six feet tall, his weight drops to 107 pounds. Many more prisoners die and many, many more lose their minds before they're finally rescued by General Patton as he storms through the barbed wire fences of the prisoner camp, standing on top of a U.S. Army tank. My grandfather attributes his ability to endure to one factor. And it wasn't his strength, spirituality, or luck. It was the voice in his head. My grandfather survived because he embraced the harsh realities of his situation and then chose to reframe that voice in his head that wanted so badly to wallow in self-pity. We all have that voice and it shapes our realities more than most of us realize. Our thoughts become our words, our words become our actions, and our actions dictate our destiny. The key word there is you. It's your thoughts and your words. You need to take ownership of this. No one will coach you more or critique you more than that voice in your head. We can take ownership of this by asking ourselves, if something is bothering you, ask yourself, is there something you can do about it? And if the answer is yes, well then don't complain. Just get busy, get to work, and do something about it. And on the flip side, if you ask yourself if something is bothering you, and the answer is no, well then don't complain. There is nothing you can do about it. And no amount of unproductive complaining is going to change that fact. Never whine. Never complain. Never make excuses. Kill the critic in your head and weaponize your mind. If I was to go against Joey on the football field today, I would still be nervous. And today, I would choose to focus on what I could control, not who my opponent was, but how I responded to that challenge. I would reframe that voice in my head that wanted so badly to wallow in self-pity into one of excitement about the opportunity to test myself against the best. And then I would go at him with everything I freaking had. Now it's your turn. I challenge you to set your sights. Kill the critic in your head and weaponize your mind. If you do, you'll be ready for anything or anyone that comes at you. Thank you.